Um, it's a good day, everyone. Thank you, Borkhoff, for having me. I'm really excited to share my research on tracking bumblebees' development. So my name is Sue, and I'm a security researcher at CrowdStrike. So our talk today will be quite technical in nature. We're going to look at timelines on the development of different bumblebee components. And what we'll notice is that the developers, they like to focus on a lot of EDR evasion techniques, some of which are worth mentioning. So we'll look at them as well. And then finally, we'll conclude drawing um, a conclusion based on observing these timelines. What can we learn about Bumblebee's developers? What does that tell us? I also want to note that uh, CrowdStrike's name for the malware in the rep used in reporting is actually Shindig, but I will continue to use Bumblebee throughout this presentation. So before we look at development timelines, we might as well look at a really short history timeline on Bumblebee. It will also help us to follow the presentation better, I believe. So Bumblebee started, was actually first reported in March 2022, as you see here. It was reported by Google Tag. The researchers, they observed this new loader being used by affiliates who were previously associated with Conti. And that is also how they gave it its name. Uh, the Bumblebee string was used in the user agent header when it made requests to the server. Now, the same affiliates used a similar loader uh, when they were targeting a CVE in a campaign back in August 2021. Microsoft reported that incident in September of that year, but that loader was mainly used for distributing COBOL strike. It didn't have the bot-like capabilities that we see Bumblebee having right now. So when we're looking at the timelines, we're going to focus on Bumblebee when it started off as a bot. And we believe that date to be 31st of Jan 2022. So shortly after the first report, uh, there was an uptick in activity. Uh, there was, it started spreading more and more. In fact, it started off with three major affiliates using the malware. And uh, there were more affiliates, so, but this graph just shows the major ones. And subsequently down the line, more and more affiliates joined the program. Uh, the developers as well went on two different hiatuses, and they're seen distributed by the likes of Smokebot and Bathloader, to name a few. Um, so what is the malware like when it infects a system? I thought I might as well give a high-level overview, because then it will... Uh, you will like, more or less follow the timeline better from this. As with most e-crime malware, it starts off with the loader that is packed and encrypted. It will unpack our malware. In Bumblebee's case, it is always a DLL file. So once unpacked, Bumblebee communicates with the server to receive commands. They refer to them as tasks. They are abbreviated three-letter strings. Uh, hopefully you can see that. So as you see here, like taking, for instance, SIJ, stands for shellcode injection. I won't go through this list quite yet because we are going to talk on tasks on, uh, much later in the talk. Um, also, the unpacked file has a hook module that's used in conjunction with two of the tasks. Um, Bumblebee 2 is modular in nature. It can run plugins uh, simultaneously, and those plugins as well can communicate with the server. So uh, from this image, I might as well mention, the timelines we're going to look at is the development of the loader and the main DLL. A second timeline would be uh, changes made to the C2 comms, and then finally, the tasks. So here's our first GAN timeline analysis chart. Just a quick show of hands, who here is aware of what a GAN timeline is? <laughs> okay, a few of you. So I might as well just give a quick description on it. So a GAN timeline, it is, uh, as you can tell, it is a timeline chart. It's so from the left to the right. Uh, in, Bumble, in this case, it starts off at 31st of Jan, and it will end until uh, 1st of March this year. That's what the research is based on. And then from top to bottom, you see the techniques or the, that the malware was using, so what they've initially used and dropped, and you can see the duration of how long those techniques were being used. I didn't add every possible technique here because it would not fit a slide. I added what I thought would be more interesting for the talk. So in the very beginning when Bumblebee started, um, it didn't have a loader. It was very simple. I, I think it was 
a tactic by the developers for testing out the bot. They were not even distributing it. So the loader actually started getting used around the time that activity was picking up for the malware. Before we look at some of these techniques, I want to mention that Bumblebee's main DLL and plugins uses a lot of uh, code from the function borrowed from Boost library. Boost is an open source C++ library. It is uh, header based. That means any program that uses Boost ends up statically compiling a lot of those functions within the binary. And this is why Bumblebee's files are quite big in size. So despite in the beginning being new and you know, being tested, it did have what we believe to be an EDR evasion technique. This was where the malware would hook the API RTL exit user process. It was only hooked if there was an AV hook present on it. Um, that was to make sure, so the trampoline code would make sure that Bumblebee finished its execution before it went, the control went back to the antivirus hook, likely to prevent the antivirus from analyzing the process any further and flagging it as malicious. They did, though, drop this for thread execution hijacking by end of June, I believe, uh, which, in my opinion, <laughs> is a much better EDR evasion. I'll talk on that on a later slide. Now, when the loader was introduced, it wasn't only used for packing the malware. It, too, had an EDR evasion called remote library injection. And we'll talk on that, too, in a later slide. The developers, as well, played with a different format of the loader. They, when they came back from their first hiatus, they started using PowerSploit's uh, reflective DLL injection. So not only is the loader now a PowerShell file, it also has another EDR on top of the remote library injection. Right now, we see it mostly in campaigns for SEO poisoning and malvertising. Finally, I have to mention Alcazar. Alcazo came about, uh, it's actually a repository on GitHub, by the way. Um, it came about mid-April, also around the time a lot more public reports were starting to come out on Bumblebee. Uh, this repository contains different ch anti-analysis checks one can run on a machine. Uh, so the ma malware used exclusively all of those checks at the beginning of execution. It made sense, you know, to prevent analysis like us to, uh, you know, study the malware any further. They did, though, interestingly, drop it before going on their second break. It wasn't really clear why. Uh, I thought it was interesting, but they introduced it back after coming from the break and in a completely different context. So we'll see that more when we talk on the C2 communication. So now let's look at the EDR evasion. First off, we have is the remote library injection. So this is the EDR evasion used by the loader. Now, the purpose of this technique is to masquerade Bumblebee's main DLL to appear running as a legitimate DLL. In this screenshot, it's a process explorer. You can see the active threads uh, of Bumblebee's process. One of those threads is pointing to this library called Dim's Room. It's a Windows system library. So if you were to analyze the malware, you'd think, oh, Dim's Room is running, but in fact, it's Bumblebee. The one giveaway here is you can see referencing the export function set path that belongs to the malware. Now, the way this technique can achieve it is it hooks APIs used by NTDLL for mapping and loading libraries in memory. Generally, that operation is performed on a physical file on disk, but by hooking the API, they can use that same operation against an unpacked file in memory. Um, now, this proof of concept is not new. It was released in 2004. Uh, but interestingly enough, the only other malware seen used in it is Ramnet, as was pointed out by uh, IBM in one of their blogs. Um, and <laughs> this is an even interesting part. Uh, one of Ramnet's loaders matches exactly that with Bumblebee's loader when used in conjunction with PowerSploit. And it's quite interesting, given after the Ramnet talk by Clearfy, um, <laughs> given that Ramnet also was seen using PowerSploit. So, uh, so it's not to say that developers necessarily were either aware of this technique or were the same group, but definitely a lot of borrowed code here. Next off we have is thread execution hijacking, uh, the EDR evasion used by the main DLL. Now, 
This technique masquerades Bumblebee's offset in memory to appear under a decoy offset. And that decoy offset belongs to this long-named API uh, part of NTDLL. Again, we have a screenshot of Process Explorer. You can see the active thread. And it looks like the API is running, but as you can guess, it is Bumblebee. Now, this technique can do this uh, by first, it creates the API as in a suspended thread mode. So when the thread is suspended, it can modify the thread's context structure. Within the structure is a field which specifies the offset, the start offset. It just swaps the API's address with that of Bumblebee. Generally, this technique is used for process injection. Uh, there's a good entry of that in MITRE attack. I was trying to find something similar, uh, like a POC or had no luck. The closest I could come to was this blog that talks about Cozy Bear's Dropbox loader using this very exact same technique and, funny enough, the same API name as a decoy. Um, so again, you know, coincidence maybe or not, uh, but def not new and a lot of borrowed code. So finally, that brings us to the C2 communication. Right now, Bumblebee uses a WebSocket protocol. It creates messages in JSON format. Uh, they're RC4 encrypted before sending as a request or receiving as a response the keys in the main DLL file. This uh, here, as you can see, is a truncated version of what those messages look like. It would be, it's not possible to give the entire version since it would be quite small on the slides. Uh, I've also labeled them as ping, hit, and task just to explain the flow better. Uh, now, these messages, they get sent in a loop. Uh, Bumblebee has a beaconing style communication. And that's, you see that quite common these days with eCrime. And especially if you read DFIR reports, you notice that you know, a lot of them tend to beacon and the payload gets delivered after you know, an undeterminate amount of time. Uh, so uh, now let's talk about the messages. So now the whole point for the ping message is to send across the bot's ID. In turn, it receives a session ID from the server. And the session ID is used in throughout the other request messages, and that's likely for their backend to track what the messages are. And then finally, it ends up with the task response that will relate the tasks, our commands, and potential payloads for the malware. What about this hit? This is where Alcazar comes into play. So like uh, in the first timeline we saw, Alcazar was used. All those checks were used at the beginning of execution. Bumblebee dropped that, and now it's only run when it receives a command from the server. Uh, that command is in the ping's response. There's a Boolean field in there called hit. If that's set to as true, then it will run all these checks. It, it uh, puts all those checks in a really long JSON file, different Boolean field values, and sends it to the server. Um, the developers didn't only settle with using Alcazar checks. They used some of their own things like what are the current active processes running on the system, and plus this field here, binary DB, uh, it, is, it contains a base64 encoded SQL database of browsing history from Chrome and Microsoft Edge. So what other better way of telling if the system is indeed a victim or not, or a sandbox, and also to get a bit more context on who the victim is. I also have to mention, um, in case the malware receives tasks, they do send a task result type request, which is just relays a, any potential error or any information that's exfiltrated as a result of running the tasks. Now, looking through uh, the development, there's been quite a fair bit of changes over time. It's harder to kind of understand it, and I found that by grouping them on, based on certain properties, it helps us understand the flow better. So, you know, in the very beginning, at the start, uh, Bumblebee used HTTPS protocol. Of course, their infamous user agent string, Bumblebee. Um, the only messages sent across was the task. We didn't see ping or hit, and they didn't RC4 encrypt those messages. There was a client version number there, one, um, that was used in the task request, and the URL's endpoint string was called gate. Now, by mid-April, you know, around the time, as I mentioned, when there was more public reporting, they decided to randomize the user agent pattern, I know, trying to make it less suspicious, that is Bumblebee. But that was clearly short-lived, and then they changed it further. And, um, yeah, they randomized the user agent even more. Uh, they started using RC4Key to encrypt the messages. Uh, the 
URL string change from gate to gate S. S may be their way of saying secure. <laughs> um, and, and then, okay, a month after they came back from their first hiatus, uh, they switched the protocol altogether, and that's uh, WebSocket. The client version number also reflected that too, and then point string from gate S to gate W, as we can guess what W means. Uh, this is where they introduced the ping message too. And right now, where we are at uh, is, you know, the ping hit and task messages we saw earlier. And, uh, and this, uh, in the very bottom of the screen, is the user agent string they're using now. It's always the same string. And I think it's just their way of trying to make traffic look a bit more legitimate. Now, this brings us to our tasks. <laughs> Uh, on the left-hand side here, you can see a description of what those tasks mean, and on the right-hand side, uh, a really um, high-level overview on how those tasks are executed. Uh, so our first four, oops, sorry, that's not where I wanted. Okay, our first four tasks are what's responsible for running the payloads. The first three of which uh, inject the payloads in the process. They use APCQ code injection because it is. Also, a EDR evasion type technique, I will talk on that technique on a later slide. Um, they, so they are able to inject shell codes. Uh, they also can inject DLLs, two types, uh, secondary payloads that in DLL form, or their plugins, which are also in a DLL form. And if it's DLLs, it's injected along with the hook module. The, the hook module also has an EDR evasion role, and I'll talk about it too in a later slide. Bumblebee, as well, has an option for just directly executing the payload through DEX. Uh, GDT get data allows the malware to run bash commands on the system. Now, instead of directly invoking it via command.exe, they pass those bash commands to command.exe's standard input-output via named pipes. This is um, actually quite a common programming um, uh, type technique, so it's not entirely malicious. Uh, then there's INS for install, which creates persistence. The malware uses WMI. And finally, SDL, silent delete. Uh, the malware uses PowerShell to delete itself. And our final Gantt chart for today. So let's start off with the INS task. Um, this task, before they used WMI, that shift was made uh, early May, they were using regular Win32 APIs, things like create directory and stuff. So you could see the process actually creating these artifacts. The shift to WMI is actually quite smart because any process that gets created with WMI ends up showing as a child process of the WMI parent. So there's a like an, an unintentional parent PID spoofing. You do not see the child parent process creation. So it's harder to uh, track what the malware is doing. So continuing with that same task, the way it's implemented differed based on what loader was being used. So as in the beginning I showed, they were using either PowerSploit or it started off as a regular packed file. So if it is PowerSploit, you know, the file is a PowerShell file, um, the malware in this case would use Windows Data Protection API. Uh, this um, technique allows to encrypt the file using system encryption. Uh, that's likely to prevent antivirus as they scan the file from reading the contents and likely flagging it as malicious. And accordingly, the malware will create a schedule task that executes a script which uses DP API to decrypt the contents back before running it. Now, if it came in the packed DLL form, it was already encrypted, it was already packed, there was no need for using DP API, so they just used the living off the land binary, ODBC conf, to execute the DLL. Uh, GDT, so that was introduced early May. Uh, when they introduced it, it had a very simple implementation. Uh, here's the funny part, it matches exactly that with MSDN's documentation on how one can pass uh, uh, input to a process, a child process created by a parent process. Uh, I thought it was quite clever because it creates anonymous name pipes, which are harder to track what those commands are, but they were clearly just testing the technique. It doesn't allow to asynchronously execute as many commands as you'd like. So by, I think, uh, two weeks later or so, they just switched to using the Boost uh, library framework on it, so boost.asio, which allows for asynchronously running as many programs, I mean, uh, commands. Uh, 
Um, uh, so here is a screenshot of the pipe names that get created as a result of using this library. It is not necessarily malicious because you know Boost is open source, but it's a great way for hunting. And also at the end of the name, uh, pipe name, as you can see, uh, numeral value, that's the process PID, so the resulting process that created this uh, name pipe. Finally, um, I want to mention about PLG. So PLG is what uh, allows, which is the task responsible for executing Bumblebee's plugins. That was introduced around the time they switched to WebSocket uh, protocol, and I guess they decided to make the malware more modular in nature. So when they introduced it, uh, they needed a way to communicate with the plugins. And so they use uh, RPC, uh, they created an RPC endpoint via named pipes, and this allows for inter-process communication. Again, not entirely malicious, but a common programming technique. Uh, currently, uh, what, uh, so when the plugin uses, communicates to the bot, main bot via this uh, pipe, they can access what is the active C2 server IP address and the active port that the bot is communicating with. And so once it acquires, it can separately communicate with the same server. So now we have the asynchronous uh, procedure call queue code injection. <laughs> that was quite long. Um, so, okay, this technique is getting very popular as injection, uh, as a process injection technique. Uh, there's a MITRE attack entry on it where you can see other malware using it. So, this one, uh, to give a short description, is malware, they take advantage of APC by forcing uh, another process thread to execute code injected into a process um, that's been added to that thread's APC queue. So every thread has an APC queue, and when the thread is in an alertable state, it ends up executing whatever has been added to that queue. So in Bumblebee's case, um, what uh, Bumblebee does, okay, so they create the process, and they in, uh, in suspended mode, they inject the payload, uh, and before injecting it, they also modify the entry point of the process. Where they place different instructions in there, in this case, the instructions are, it ends up calling the API sleepx in a loop. So sleepx is what allows uh, the thread to be in an alertable state. So when the, pro when the process is resumed, uh, sleepx gets called and the resulting injected code is run. So in the shell codes case, it's just a shell code. Um, for DLL injection, there's a loader stub that gets run first. That will load the hook module. The hook module does its job. And finally, it'll run the payload. So it's, uh, this is quite stealthy because uh, APC injection is not necessarily malicious. It is quite common in asynchronous programming. This is more that it makes it harder to monitor. Uh, so you need, I guess, different types of detection logic, which um, uh, MITRE tag does list something, but it is still quite hard. And on top of it, Bumblebee doesn't just inject the payloads into any process. It injects it into processes created with WMI. As we know, that creates a parent PID spoof, uh, spoofing. So, bam, we have two stealth in one here. Finally, the hook module. Um, hook module is quite simple. It removes uh, any, any EDR hooks on APIs. Uh, it actually comes with a hard-coded list of different APIs that it looks for. Uh, so it does this by first comparing the API's instructions in memory to that of its instructions in the physical file on disk, because a uh, hook is only pr present uh, when it's in memory rather than on the disk. It does the comparison using a function called a length disassembler. A length disassembler essentially disassembles the instructions, um, and then it also to get the exact length of an instruction, and it also compares the prefix. Now, if either the length or the prefix is different, it's likely it's been modified, it's hooked, in which case it just copies the instructions from the physical file to the instru API's instructions in memory. Um, and then, yeah, finally, it uses a remote library injection. This was the EDR evasion used by the loader uses the same technique to load the payload DLL to appear running as a legitimate DLL. I do want to expand, though, on that length disassembler. Uh, in Bumblebee's case, it, uh, that length disassembler matches exactly that with this open source library called libsplice. It's present on GitHub. Uh, 
Uh, it's also that same library is seen commonly used by Ramnet, TrickBots. Uh, some of TrickBots modules have used it, BotBots, proxy modules, a lot of game cheats. You see it referenced in a lot of forums. <laughs> a lot of hackers out there tend to reference it. Um, in, you know, in our, I guess, in the industry, we tend to call it uh, inline hooking, this technique, but um, in the hacking community, they call it splicing. So it's not something entirely new. In fact, this library is almost a decade old. Uh, but uh, so it's interesting that they use it. Um, you know, clearly all the mal other malware use it. So why, uh, you know, use anything different um, when something out there works already for your case? Now that brings us to our conclusion. So now from all these timelines, what it helps us is, is, is it helps us to map uh, activity to what Bumblebee's software development lifecycle looks like. Um, so clearly, they seem to have an agile methodology about how they develop the malware. So at the very beginning, when we saw Ma Bumblebee being tested out, uh, you know, it was quite simple. In agile terms, you would call that as MVP, a minimal viable product. Uh, in fact, uh, in a lot of these forums where malware authors try to promote uh, their loaders, they tend to say beta version or this is my MVP loader. Um, it's almost like it's a very startup culture like. It's uh, kind of like they're getting uh, funding for their project. <laughs> so clearly they were testing out uh, between that period and then. Phase two started off, you know, end of March, the same time the loader was introduced, and also where they included more EDR evasion. Um, EDR evasion is definitely big for a lot of the loaders. A lot of these affiliates, they're more worried. They don't want their payloads to get detected. Uh, so they just want a reliable loader that will bypass EDR. So apart from this, uh, we also noticed that the developers seem to focus on the C2 infrastructure on uh, during the hiatus period. And in our heads, I guess, when we think of hiatus, we think the developers are on a break. But uh, in this case, they're not. They're more on a break from distribution. Now, this makes sense because if you're going to change your backend, you want to be able to distribute a malware that can communicate with your backend infrastructure. So they're still quite active, uh, you know, and uh, even though they're on a hiatus period. And it's also a flag for us when the malware goes quiet, because then we are like, oh, they are up to something. <laughs> uh, these developers, too, seem to step out of the norm in how they've gone about developing this malware. We don't see them using API hashing or string obfuscation. Uh, I, I guess not yet. Uh, it wasn't clear why, so I kind of gambled on why this could be the case. Um, maybe it's a result of how they are using these EDR evasion techniques. So as we saw with the loader and with the main DLL, those techniques, they make it appear as if it's a system DLL running or if it's an API's address in memory running. So if an antivirus, you know, it's less likely to scan something that it doesn't believe to be part of the actual process um, um, you know, address or the actual process itself. So in this case, it, you know, Yara rules would be quite useless in trying to detect the malware in memory. Uh, finally, uh, the developers, they seem to have some mature dev practices, uh, especially the fact that they use Boost and, you know, it's used for communicating with the C2. It's used in the GDT task when it uh, needs to run pr commands asynchronously. Boost is not really common, not quite common among malware. It is, there are some families out there that do use it. It makes it quite bulky, but the fact that they use it means, um, you know, they, it do, they do not need to bother about what Win32 APIs they need to use, end of the day. They can use a library that works. And also the fact that they're using a really common library for splicing, libsplice. You know, they want to make sure, especially when you're modifying an API instruction in memory, uh, you want to make sure that you modify it properly, otherwise your payloads won't run. Uh, and yeah, so hopefully you uh, enjoyed the talk, you've learned something about what goes behind developing malware, what that looks like, and I look forward to any questions. <laughs> Questions.
Thanks for the presentation, a great research. Thank you. And um, I have a short comment about Boost. Actually, the Boost <laughs> okay. library is used by the developers, mm -hmm. like normal developers. Mm -hmm. So maybe they hired somebody experienced <laughs> on the team. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another one, did you see um, how it's being delivered, like through phishing or and, uh, mm -hmm. anything else? Um, yeah, so I didn't talk too much about the campaign, because uh, uh, which focuses a lot on the distribution techniques, but it's usually spam. Um, and they use, uh, you know, ever since the um, macros were disabled, they started using things like ISOs, container files, uh, VHDs. Um, and now SEO poisoning is quite common. So uh, they, they start off with MSI installers. Um, the MSI installers, yeah, usually has the PowerShell file. I have seen them use the executable file, so there's DLL side loading. Um, I think that's what comes to mind. There's probably some more out there. Yeah, but and mostly spam. No, if I may, one more. So, uh, and did you detect many of infections throughout your, like, telemetry uh, of the company, like, searching for the stuff? Did I take what? Sorry. Yeah, did detect any live detections after you started um, researching it and, you know, um, feed the feedback to the systems. Uh, did, you, did you see many infections or? Um, uh, so that's an interesting question. I don't know if I'm uh, quite allowed to talk about uh, <laughs> infections within the company, but we can talk about it later. I'll just side on the air of caution here. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you.